Good morning. I'm, I, I'm, you're almost as surprised to see me up here as I am myself. So it's all good. Uh, first of all, I'd really like to say something in, in regard to Herb and, and Ruth. You know, sometimes when someone passes away, they say, well, his work on earth is, is complete, it's finished. And I don't believe it for, for a moment. I know the impact that their lives had on myself and my wife, and it was a big impact. And, and you see, the way it works is, as his life impacted my life, and then as my life impacted someone else's life, because of the impact on my life, it be continues to flow out like a ripple. And the ripples of Herb's life will continue to flow. And I just bless God for that. Uh, yesterday afternoon, I got a, I got a call from... Uh, Call from Pastor Dan, and uh, basically he said he wasn't feeling so good. And he was hoping to be here, but he said, if I can't, will you be my backup? So I said, yes, thinking, no, I, I can do a sermon and, you know, and whatever, and wonder what should I do? And then he goes, and I will send you my sermon notes. And so we're on a series on the decorations, so he sent me his sermon notes, on abundance, and so last night I was here, and if I'm speaking, I like to I like to come and when it's all empty, speak to the speak to the chairs, you know, get my thoughts together and all that sort of thing. And and I want to say that last night all it was was Dan's notes, and I'm going, oh, hopefully he'll be here this morning. <laughs> However, this morning I came and and it began to flow and. And it became, it became my message based on his notes. And on my way home from church this morning, I, I got a text from Dan, you know, letting me know I'm, I'm staying home. And I texted him back and said, I'm, I'm, fully, I'm fully prepared. Uh, I think it's good that Dan stayed home today. You know, sometimes... Pastors, they kind of think that they have to be Superman. They got to do everything. And Dan in this season has learned that he needs to walk with judgment. He needs to take into account how he's feeling and not just push through and be, you know, do, do more harm than good. So here I am. I feel that the Lord is with me. He has an important message to say about abundance. Abundance can be kind of a controversial subject in Christian circles because there's such a wide spectrum of opinion about where abundance fits in. Now, I was a pastor in England. I did my final year of Bible college in the early 80s in England, and I was pastored there. I was there for 12 and a half years. And uh, first church I was in was a very small church. And the majority of the people were OAPs. You know what OAPs are? Well, you're looking, looking at one now. <laughs> Old age pensioners. <laughs> yep. I'm actually getting a small pension from England for my time there. So there you go. So I am one now. Uh, but... Finance wasn't a big, strong point in the church. They didn't have a lot of money. It's not that they weren't, they weren't good people, but there wasn't a lot of money. And my starting salary was 60 pounds a week. That, that translates to about $100 a week, and that was for a family of four. Now, they had a church house, which was a nice house, and we didn't have to pay rent, and we didn't uh, have to pay for upkeep. But heating and light and food, you know, all that sort of stuff, clothes, shoes, you know, for kids who are growing and all that sort of thing, it, we had $100 a week. And I'm not, I'm not complaining. We never, we never felt that we were lacking in anything. It wasn't an issue. But they had this quaint saying, you know, not just the church, but they had heard it from someplace else. Lord... 
you keep your, your, our pastor humble, and we will keep them poor. <laughs> See, it was, a, it was a mentality that thought that somehow being poor was spiritual, that you had too much of the, the things of this world, and then that wasn't a good thing. And so it was much better to be poor and serving the Lord than in another condition. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, <laughs> there is that extreme uh, prosperity teaching that, that basically says if you don't have a lot of stuff, you must not be really walking with the Lord. Something spiritually is wrong with you. Because after all, God's, God's, the proof that God is blessing you is you got a lot of stuff, you got a lot of whatever. James wrote in chapter 4 of James that for some, you have not because you ask not. That's the poverty mentality. You know, we don't ask because we don't deserve or we don't need or we, don't, we shouldn't have. But then there's the others who ask amiss so that they can really spend it on their own pleasures. Both extremes are bad. Both extremes are not godly. But we're going to be looking at a lot of scriptures this morning about what the Bible has to say about uh, abundance. We have uh, declarations that we made a number of years ago. And it wasn't just one person did it. The, the, the staff and the elders, we got together, we, we had a weekend. And one of the things we did is looked at diff different scriptures that were important to us. And and had to do with declarations. And in the end, we came up with t 10 categories that, that most of those scriptures that we, uh, we wrote down, the different people contributed, kind of, uh, they kind of expressed the scriptures. And one of the areas was abundance. So our declaration of abundance is, I declare God's abundance over my life for every good work for every good thing he has called me to do. I declare that God is doing exceedingly abundantly above all I can ask or think according to the power that works in me. John 10.10 10 says this, the thief comes not except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The literal translation for this word abundantly is superabundance, excessive, overflowing, surplus, over and above, more than enough. God wants us to live an abundant life, an abundant life, an overflowing life. He doesn't want us simply to scrape by and to survive and to hold on till we get to heaven. 3 John 2, verse 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. The word prosper means prosperous or successful journey to accomplish what you intend to do successfully. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. For every good work, for every good thing, God promises abundance. And God's abundance isn't just about money. Some, you know, you start talking about abundance and, it, and our minds go, well, he's, he's just talking about money. It's far more, far more than money. A few weeks ago when Sean Smith was here, uh, he was in the morning service, he was preaching, and he was preaching about opening up the wells. He talked about the wells that the enemy had come, and, and they had thrown dirt and rocks in, and they had, they had stopped them up so that they were no longer were, were, there was no flow of water. And he was, he was talking about reopening the wells, and and I tell you, my, my spirit, I was right there. I'm going, yes, God, open up the wells. Open up the wells. I want to see revival. I want to see God's power move. And I was so with him. 
And then, and then at the end, he said, he was talking about person, our personal wells. And I'm thinking, yes, Lord, open up the wells of the people. <laughs> and then, he, and then he, he said, and if certain things are happening, maybe that's a sign that your well is stopped up. And when he said, if you don't have joy like you've had in the past, perhaps your well has been stopped up. And I was sitting on the second row at the end right there. And when he said that, I began to weep. Not a little. I was trying to be somewhat discreet and quiet. <laughs> I wept. One of my life verses is the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's been a quality that's been a strength for my life. And I realized my joy was not where it had been. I realized that my will was stopped up. If you had asked me as I walked through that door that morning, is your will stopped up? I would think, huh, not me. <laughs> but my well was stopped up. Part of it had to do with situations at work that were very difficult and things that I was battling to try to get things moving in a direction that I believe needed to be take place. But I, I discovered that I was finding frustration and I was finding myself in a different place than joy. And as I wept, I, I wanted to come up to the altar, but I didn't. And then they called the fourth of the prayer team to go up, and there's very few times when there's a call for the prayer team to go up, and I, did, and I don't go up. And I didn't. And then I look up, and then there's prayer team. They're all spread out, except there's a gap from about here to a little bit over there. And I go, okay, well, I guess that spot right there on the altar will do for me. There was a hole for me to walk through. So I walked through, and I knelt down, and I wept some more. And during that weeping, I repented. I can't just blame the enemy for stopping up my wells. I, I allowed it to happen. I was the one that was trying to fix things in my own power and not relying on the Lord, getting involved with personalities and all that sort of thing. So I, I repented here. And I, I tell you, there's so much better to go to work with joy rather than frustration. Things have actually... We, I, some of the things that needed to happen, that needed to change, some of those things are actually happening, and I rejoice in God for that. But you see, God has for us an abundance and not just money. God wants to give us a richness in the quality of our life. A richness not according to what the world can give, not according to what the world can offer but according to who he is. A richness of joy, of peace, a richness that, that the world and our circumstances of life cannot take away. Because we all face circumstances. We all face things in our life. But there is a quality of life that he gives to us. Hallelujah. You see, abundant life is available to us all. There's a scripture in Isaiah, Isaiah 55, 1 and 2. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money on that which is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Those who know me know that one of the principal, way, 
principal ways God speaks to me is he gives me pictures, visions. They're not visions, open visions that I see with my eyes, but they're pictures in my mind, but they're nevertheless they're from God. I have seen over the 40 years that I've been a Christian, I've seen thousands of pictures. And sometimes, often, it's when I'm praying for someone, they'll give me a picture. And sometimes, a couple of weeks later, they'll, they'll say, remember the picture? And I'm thinking, no, I don't really. <laughs> Most of them I forget. Now, sometimes if they remind me about specifics, I can recall it. But there are pictures that God has given me over the years that have stayed with me forever. One of those pictures goes along with this scripture in Isaiah. I saw a church, and I saw the church, and I saw people standing in the church. There were no chairs or no pews. They were just standing in the church. And they all looked like, like porcelain vases. And they were just tall and thin, but they were people, and they had a hole in the top. And I saw that. And then I saw the roof of the church just fade away. It was just gone. And I saw Jesus above it, and he was very large in comparison to the church. And he had a golden pitcher, and he began to pour out the pitcher upon the people. And some of the people were standing like this, holding an umbrella. And the umbrella was just big enough to cover the top in the vase which was their life. And the water would hit the umbrella, it would fill, fill to the floor, and it just disappeared into the floor. It was just gone. There was no trace of it. But others were open. And the water began to pour, and he didn't just fill them to the top, he filled them to overflowing. And, and some of them, different amounts, there was kind of dirt and crud coming up at first from the vase that was in the vase, and the water was causing that to go up, out. And then, and then as that all was cleared away, the water that was overflowing was pure and clean. And when the Lord stopped with the pitcher, the overflow continued. And then I saw those vases go out into the community, and some went into a crowd, and it was kind of like the plague, because it was very infectious. I mean, as they were out and they were overflowing, it was overflowing to others. And, and then, then the others, they began to overflow and it began to spread. And I saw them going to homes and I saw families being touched and the overflowing. And the, it was the multiplication of the blessing of God. That's kind of how Herb and Ruth were to me. Out of their overflow, God has caused a flow in my heart, in my life. God invites us to an abundant life. God wants us to accept the invitation into this life. And you see, all that God gives, he gives freely. We're admonished, freely you receive, freely give. In the 1970s, which is ancient history for, for a lot of us, um, for some here it was prehistoric, <laughs> for you, <laughs> yes. In the 1970s, I was a, a bus driver for Metro Transit. And one of the types of buses I drove were the electric trolleys. So there's overhead wires, two wires up, up above, and then you have the bus and you have two poles that are connected to the wires. At least that's what you would try to do is keep them connected to the wires. And from one pole, from one wire, down one pole, the electricity goes down. It goes through the electric motor. And then the other pole goes back up and is put back on the wire. Because with electricity, you would have to have a complete circuit. If the circuit is broken, there's no power flowing. So you learn quite quickly that there are times that you had to slow down. If you go around a curve too fast, you could lose a pole. If you went through an intersection where wires crossed too fast, you could lose a pole. So they had ropes on the poles, and the reason for the ropes on the poles is 
if a pole went up and there was a spring making it go up, but if it went up high when it came off, there was the danger of the pole pulling down the wires from above. So there's a mechanism that causes a spring to pull it down. So when you lose the pole, you get to go out. The bus will stop. It's not, you can roll it for a little while, but it's gonna, there's no power anymore. It's not like they've got a battery, now you're running off the battery. No, it's, it's done. There's no power. So you have to go out, you have to take the rope, and you have to jerk on the mechanism a few times to loose the spring. And then you have to take it sometimes into traffic and try to get it back on the wire. The special times when, when it was raining real hard. <laughs> yeah. Because those wires were, you had a lot of, you know, gunk on them. And sometimes you'd get, you hit the wire when you put it on and it'd come down. Yeah, it was nasty. One time, one time I lost two poles at once. I, I didn't understand it because I, I, was, I was southbound on 9th Avenue by Jefferson, which is close to Harbor, uh, the hospital, Harbor View Hospital. So I'm going down, and you'd hear a little ping when you lost a pole. I heard ping, ping, and then there's no power. And I'm looking around, and I go, oh, no. So I pick up my radio, and I call the dispatcher. I go, yeah, I am uh, southbound on Ninth Avenue south of Jefferson. And he goes, south of Jefferson? I said, yeah, south of Jefferson. I'll wait here for you. The, the bus route, along with the wires, they, they make a left turn at Jefferson. I went straight. <laughs> yeah. I had heard stories about drivers drive doing the same thing and figuring out a way to just kind of coast down and get back underneath some wire. And I quickly thought, and I go, no, it's not going to work in this location. So there I was. Actually, there was, uh, I was really close to where the electric trolley base was and only a few blocks away. And they have a push truck in the yard. And so they came down and pushed me back underneath the wires. And I was on my way in less than 10 minutes. It was an evening run. And at night, we all have a layover downtown for people to transfer. And, and I was down there. And one of the road supervisors comes to me. And he's kind of laughing and joking with me. And anyway, I'm feeling really stupid. And, he goes, yeah, the dispatcher sent me down to talk to you to make sure you weren't drunk or high on drugs. <laughs> I said, no, I'm just full of stupid right now. <laughs> but you see, if you want the power to flow in your life, first of all, you need to receive. But second of all, you need to give out. If either one is not flowing, the power is not going to flow. If we don't step out in obedience time after time after time, God is going to find someone else that he can pour out and use. And if we've been in that place, do what I did. Repent. God wants to use us. He wants us to be those who overflow and touch the lives of others. Every one of us. Every one of us has things to do. You have things for you to do that I cannot do. You have connections with people that will never cross my path. God will use each one of us. You don't have to say, well, I can't do this or I can't do that. That's not the point. God has something you can do. He has something, whether it's a smile or a word of encouragement, whatever it is. God wants to pour out his abundance, his blessing on you. That his power and that his love might flow through you. Hallelujah. Another thing about the abundant life is the abundant life is avail available through his promises. 2 Peter 1, 2-4. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit, 
for obedience and the sprinkling of blood of the blood of Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for us. And God's provision comes through his promises. When he gives us a promise, He will provide the means for us to fulfill that. When God calls us to things, if he only calls us to things that we can do in our own own strength, that's, that's not much. He calls us to things that we cannot fulfill in the strength that we have, so that we have to depend on him. And as he promises, so he will provide. In 1978, my wife and I felt that God was calling us to go to England. And it was an exciting time. And, and when we first got the call, we didn't tell anyone. And for over a month, we just prayed. And, and it remained that we really felt that God was calling us to England. First person we, we talked to was our pastor, who was Pastor Alan Capel at uh, Westgate. And, and he was a Welshman, and he had been a pastor in England before he came over here and my original plan was that I had already done a couple years of Bible college at Seattle Bible College is that I was going to finish uh, my Bible college here and then go there to apply for the ministry but he contacted some of his friends and they uh, they said that what they really wanted him to do wanted me to do was to come and finish over there that way they could get to know me and I could get to know them and then apply for the ministry. So that's, that's what we did. And it was the spring of, of 1978 and we uh, applied for Bible college and began to make preparations for that we'd be able to go. And um, I could take you to the spot. I was, I was working, I was driving a bus, I was at a red light. I could take you to the spot. North end of Capitol Hill Yep. And I'm thinking about what do I do next and how should I go about doing this, putting my house on the market. And I know people have heard the audible voice of God. I've never, I've never actually heard the audible voice of God, but this was the closest I ever had. And what the Lord said to me was, don't do anything about the sale of your house. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> don't do anything. So I... I didn't. So I applied for Bible college for the fall and said, God is going to provide in some way. You know, I didn't know. Maybe someone was just going to knock on my door and say, I want to buy your house for cash. <laughs> there it is. Slap it down on our kitchen table. I don't, you know, I don't know. But I was confident that God would, would provide. And so the time came and the time went. And we are still here. So three years later in the spring of 81, I'm praying and God says, put your house on the market. I'm going, what? Is, what? <laughs> but, but you said. And I'm, th I'm, I'm all confused. What? He said, put your house on the market. Okay. So we did that. End of July, uh, we had a buyer. And uh, so we thought we were all set. We had already applied again for Bible college that, that fall. Things were moving forward. We were all excited. And uh, our buyers were having, had, had applied for a special program to buy the house, and they're having trouble getting it. And so time is moving on, and now it's, it's getting into the second half of August. School starts in September. And I'm praying at Westgate in the morning at the prayer meeting, and God says a crazy thing to me. He says he wants me to quit my job before the house closes. But that does not make any sense at all. I mean, I was, we were young and married. We had two kids. I mean, 
we weren't we weren't poor. We you know we weren't in a bad place, but still we're living pretty much paycheck to paycheck. It was like that makes no sense. So I said to the Lord, Lord, I am willing to do that, but I did have a but. You're going to have to convince my wife. You're going to have to convince Debbie that this is a good idea because I am not going to do anything to try to convince her. I'm not going to push her into something that later on is going to come back and, you know, I wasn't. And actually it was wisdom because we needed to be on the same page. So I go home and I tell her and she, her reaction is similar to mine. What? <laughs> and then she said, well, do you have a word to go with with? what you just think that God spoke to you. I said, well, wait a minute, maybe I do. Because as soon as she said that, uh, a scripture reference came to me. It was in Isaiah. I had no idea what it was, so we turned to it, and it was a, the prophecy of the virgin birth. And the first part of that verse says, the Lord himself shall give a sign. I said, well, looks like the Lord himself will give a sign. So we prayed, <laughs> Lord, we're looking to you to give us a sign. We don't know, and we had, didn't have a clue what it would be. So I go to work, and I come home from work that, that day, and when I come home from work, Debbie goes, where was that in Isaiah? That, that, and I told her where it was. She said, well, I was reading in Isaiah today, and I was reading about Hezekiah, and God gave him options for signs, and the one Hezekiah took was that the sundial would move back 10 degrees, and I think that that has to do with it. I think something to do with that is what the sign is supposed to be. So we prayed again, and time was moving on. So it's one of the last days of August. It's getting down there. And I was at work, and all of a sudden I panicked because in my mind I was thinking that school started on the 16th of September. And that day I realized the 16th of September was the date from three years previously when school was starting. And I wasn't really sure what the date was, and I thought it could be even sooner. So I come, come home, and I'm in a panic, and ah! And you know, I tell her as I go back to my desk, and I'm looking for my letter of acceptance and trying to figure out what, what is the date. And I read it, and it's go, ah, oh, it's the 26th. I've got more time. So I come out, and tell Debbie, and she goes, that's the sign. So what are you talking about? That's the sign. God just moved the sundial back 10 days, 10 degrees. That's the sign. You're supposed to quit. Now, now we're, we're not only faced with, we're faced with the reality that it's time. And like it's like whoa, because it still didn't make any as much sense to the natural mind as it just didn't make sense. So we called up some friends. We got together. We prayed. I went to work the next day. And there was a driver's room, and then there was office with different people who worked in the office. And one of the one of the secretaries in the office came out for some reason, and and they all knew that I was planning to leave. And so she said to me, "Are you planning to walk through your pension?" So I was part of the state pension system, driving for Metro Transit. And if you quit your job and didn't take re your retirement, all the money you had contributed would go back to you. But I was told it took a month or two months after you quit for you, if you actually get the check. And she said, and I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, if you actually drive down to Olympia and sign the papers, you can get the check right then. And so, we had the promise, England was our promised land, and now we had the provision. You see, the provision was there all the time. It was a matter of timing. So God, God made a way, and it turned out, it actually took a week. You had to go down there and sign papers, and the next week you'd go down and pick it up, which we did. So I worked two more days after that, and I was done. God's provision is there with the promise. When I was preparing this, this message, to, 
I, uh, God challenged me with, uh, challenged me that, that I have a particular promise that hasn't fully been realized and that I have not been battling for it. And that I need to, I need to battle for that promise. I have promises concerning this church that I am believing God for. I'm believing God for the expansion, for the, for the balcony, and for that wall being pushed out. I'm believing that God will supply a supernatural offering that will enable us to move forward and not, and not take so much time. This property over here where we get the, we're going to have the parking, that's the key. Because without that parking, the city would never allow us to expand the sanctuary. They made that clear to us. And now it's exciting. And I'm, I'm contending for that offering that, that we would be able to move forward and get this thing done because I believe in the outpouring that many people are going to come to come to know the Lord and that we're going to need the bigger, the bigger sanctuary. God wants you to take the promises that you have. Maybe they're promises that seem to have no life to them because they're from so far beyond, behind, and they just didn't seem to work out. God wants you to, to raise those, some of those things up and to believe him, believe him again, to contend for those things. With God's promise, there is provision. There is provision. You know, God said I, to, to the children of Israel, I'm giving you this land. He told Joshua that they were to go. He told Joshua, every place the sole of your foot will tread, I have given you this land. And God, it was their land. But they had to go in, and they had to travel, and they had to believe the Lord. Lay claim to your promises. Hallelujah. God's promises, with his promises, comes his grace. His grace. Hallelujah. Today we sang the song, I will rest in your promises. My confidence is in your faithfulness. We sang that. How true it is. God's promises are true. He wants us to lay claim of those things. The final area is that God's abundant life has also to do with abundant giving. 2 Corinthians 8, 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God that he bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty, they abound in richness of liberality. When I was in England pastoring, I had been pastoring for, a, for two or three years, and I, I started praying about having a financial breakthrough in the church. Just, Lord, help us to break through. And I began praying, and, and God challenged me. He said, I want you to double tithe. Well, in American dollars, I'm, I'm getting $100 a week. The tithe is $10. You know, if you looked at, if you really looked at it, I couldn't afford a tithe. So it doesn't matter if double tithe, I can't afford that. So it, it was not a problem. I just said, okay, Lord, I will do that. And so he said, for the next three months, I want you to double tithe. So I did that. And I had charted the attendance and different things in the church, and I had charted offerings. And on the week, on the week that I started to double tithe, there was a jump in the offering, and it was a lot more than $10. And during the whole time that I double tithed, it stayed at that level. And after I completed my assignment and I went back to just tithing because that's what I felt the Lord wanted me to do, it continued to stay at that same level. It never returned to where it was before. I was contending for breakthrough, and it was through obedience and giving that I saw it for the church. There is an obedience in giving that if you're contending for a personal breakthrough in finance, listen to what the Lord has to say. It's not, it's not any, it's being sensitive to how he leads us. It's not that, you know, everyone has to give the same because we're all in different situations. 
What's important that we learn to hear his voice and follow him. Hallelujah. I want to close, and there's, there's a lot more that I need to close. I want to close with, with one of the scriptures that has to do with um, one of the scriptures. And in, in for each of our declarations, there's some scripture references be, below them. And one is 2 Corinthians 9, 7, and 8 for abundance. But I want to work, read uh, 6 to the end. Because it shows that there is a connection when it comes to financial abundance and financial breakthrough. There is a connection between giving and receiving. Now this I say to he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Let each one do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed, for it is written, He scattered abroad and he gave to the poor. His righteousness abides forever. Now he who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. And you will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints. There was a famine in Jerusalem. And then Corinth, they were taking an offering for the saints in Jerusalem. For this service is not only fully supplying the needs of of the saints, but is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. Because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all. And while they also, by prayer on your behalf, yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And I'd like the prayer team to come forward. The fact of the matter is, God is a good father. The fact of the matter is, he wants to pour out his provision for each one of you in so many ways. Whatever is lacking, whatever is lacking, he is there to pour out. Hallelujah. God wants you to know what it is both to receive or the power to flow through you as you overflow in giving. He wants you to understand that. I tell you, there is nothing greater than to know the flow in your life. And to see, to see the grace of God, not only what you receive, but what flows through you to others. Let's stand together. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your love. I thank you that you are a good father and you are a God of abundance. And Lord, I pray for a richness in our hearts and in our lives that we would know what it was like, what it's like to have your abundance in us, that we would know what it's like to have the overflow, that many would be blessed through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.